flickers at the end of the day. I looked at the registration. It looked to me like maybe half of you have registered your clickers. So when you get to the poll, um, you'll be able to see who has them. And I'll report back in the next class. I want to go over three important lessons from the last class. First, the most obvious is that Hobbes was writing during a time of great political and social unrest and violence that was going on throughout Europe, including the devastating, nearly apocalyptic 30 years war uh, in continental Europe and the English Civil War in his own home country that resulted in the execution of the king. I said last time that this fact was staring him right in the face. It was not something that was hidden behind his back that he was unaware of. <coughs> and it's right there on the surface of his writing also. As we'll see uh, next week, he's especially concerned with the possibility of civil war that would be really devastating to everybody. So this is one of Hobbes' main concerns, and he's going to be interested in um, the possibility of avoiding that. The, the sheer terribleness of war uh, is a crucial assumption in the art of war. Second point, um, there are two maybe more philosophical points that I want to make. Um, I don't think so. Uh, he wrote a lot. We're only reading um, one uh, works from one uh, book. Um, there are some differences. His view did change somewhat, but I don't think it really can be attributed. Okay, two philosophical, deeper philosophical points that uh, I want to emphasize again. The first is that um, because of the birth of modern science, natural science, physics in particular, it became more difficult to understand the re relationship between the nature of values and ethical principles, and the natural physical world. Um, so this raised questions about metaethics, the metaphysical status of values and ethical principles. The way I described this last time was that values could no longer be assumed to be built into the basic metaphysical status of the world, built into our basic understanding of how things work. This was because if you think that the world has a teleological structure, if you think that the nature of things is to be directed toward ends, natural ends, natural goals, natural purposes that objects have, then it's easy to understand the place of values, the place of goodness in that kind of world. If built into the nature of objects is that they are, so to speak, aiming at ends or goals, well then, it's good when they achieve those ends, and it's bad when they fail to achieve there's no deep mystery here about what makes something good or bad. So it's good for the acorn to turn into the oak tree. It's bad if somebody squashes the acorn or if it's defective in some way. <coughs> the evaluation is um, sort of built into the 
nature of the object because it has an end. Without a teleological metaphysics, it's not clear how evaluations, how goodness and badness, gets introduced into the world of modern science, which rejects this teleological conception in favor of what I think I called last time efficient causality rather than final causality. So final causality is the idea that things do what they do in order to achieve their goal, in order to achieve their purpose. Efficient causality is the picture of one thing causing another sequentially. And really this is, you can associate this with kind of materialistic picture of the world where one, one material object bangs into another and it moves because of that. Other questions about that? Maybe I should say one more thing about the picture of value on a teleological view. So um, on a teleological view, we can say that the achievement of some object's goal is good. And we can say that the things which help it achieve its goal, the things which help it achieve its good, are also good. They're good in a derivative sense. They're good because they help achieve some good. So if we think that our goal, our natural purpose, our function is Happiness, maybe. Well, then the things which contribute to, sorry, if our goal, our purpose is happiness, whatever that consists in, then achieving that goal is good. And whatever it is that contributes to achieving that goal is also good in a derivative sense. So coming to class or passing the test or getting good grades or graduating may be good because that contributes to achieving our highest purpose. So we can think of the structure of ethics, as I said, as investigating what this highest purpose or goal is. Um, so there's a structure of value, a structure of goodness, that can be derived from this metaphysical Teleological. Is that clear? Questions about that? Okay, so when that metaphysical picture is rejected, that structure of goodness, that structure of value is put into question. It's not clear what it is that would make some object or some action good and another bad, if not contributing to these natural purposes. Okay, and then the other big point was that um, there was this change in orientation of ethical theory. And I said that traditionally, for something like 2,000 years, ethical theory was understood as the investigation into the good point, investigation into the highest good the goal that we all properly should be aiming at. Now, I guess I want to emphasize that this project, investigation of the good life for human beings, didn't simply disappear. Uh, and in fact, many philosophers today are engaged in that project, still thinking about what makes one life better than another. In some ways, Nietzsche is going to be concerned with that project also. But around Hobbes' time, a new problem became important, and uh, philosophical investigation um, began to look at this problem. And the problem that I said last time was that people are going to disagree about the nature of the good one. People are going to disagree about their goals and their ends 
they're going to disagree about what they are trying to accomplish. Now, maybe they're right about this. Maybe they're wrong about this. Maybe some people have mistaken understandings of what they should be trying to do. Maybe some people have mistaken understandings of what the good life consists of. But whether they're right or wrong, whether they're mistaken or correct about their views about the good life, there is this disagreement about what it consists of. People come into con people in fact come into conflict with one another because their goals conflict. And this raises um, a philosophical question that at around this time began to get much more attention, and that is simply, is it possible? for people who hold different and conflicting goals to live together without murdering each other. So this was an extremely, so again, whether they're right or wrong about the goals, is it possible for conflicting conceptions of value to function together in society? This was an extremely urgent matter. And the answer to this question, I want to emphasize to you, was not at all obvious. It's not at all clear, it certainly was not at all clear, whether it was possible for people who held different fundamental views about what religious salvation consists in could work together peacefully in a society. To make it a little bit more philosophical sounding, we can ask whether it's possible to identify principles that would resolve these conflicting values that different people hold in a way that everybody could recognize to be rational or fair, even though they continue to disagree with one another about the underlying values that they're committed to. So let me say that again. There's a question whether we can come up with principles that different people who have different under different and conflicting underlying values all can recognize, despite those differences, as rational and fair for them to get along with one another. And this is what I think I called last time the modern problem of justice. The, the, the modern question of justice starts from the assumption that there are these conflicting values, conflicting views about what way of life is best and what ends are most, wor most worthwhile, and then asks, is it possible to have principles, well, principles of justice, that allow for a fair resolution of those conflicts, um, that the different parties to this conflict, despite their conflicting values, can recognize to be rational and fair? So, this is how you should be thinking about Hobbes. As we'll see, uh, probably in the next class, Hobbes is not interested in identifying what the highest good for human beings is. He's not interested in describing what the good life would consist in. In fact, as we'll see, I think, next time, um, he explicitly denies the existence of a highest good. So the moral problem that he's interested in, the ethical problem that he's interested in, cannot be solved by identifying and analyzing what this highest good consists of. He's concerned with this problem that I just described. Um, so from this perspective, we can think of the wars of religion um, as conflicts that were fought over, I said the nature of salvation, we can think of them as wars that were fought over the nature of the good life, the nature of the highest good that we should 
achieve. Um, Christians, whether Catholic or Protestant, agreed with one another that there was an objective fact of the matter about what the true path to salvation was. They disagreed with one another violently about what that path was. And so the question here is, is it possible for people with violently conflicting views about what the highest purpose of